Hi, I'm Laura Sewell. I'm the director of the East Village Community Coalition and a vice president of the Lower East Side <laughs> Preservation Initiative, LESB. I'm here this evening with Richard Moses, the president of LESBI, who's acting as Zoom host and serving us on tech tonight, and my fellow board member, Deborah Wai. We, I, we're also brought, coming to you live from the Christadora House, the subject of our program this evening, which I wanted to share for those of you who might not know, our, my office is here. Um, so there's still, a nonprofit doing work from the this building, which is such an iconic structure in, in the neighborhood and in our lives. So I would like to introduce our host, uh, the, the guest this evening, Joyce Milambaling, received a master's in Scandinavian at UC Berkeley and a PhD in linguistics from the CUNY Graduate Center. After receiving her doctorate, she was awarded a one-year Fulbright grant in the Philippines, where she researched language policy and taught English teachers. After returning home, she worked at the Educational Testing Service in New Jersey, helping to develop the first computer-based test of English as a foreign language. For the past 25 years, she's taught at the University of Northern Iowa in Cedar Falls in the Department of Languages and Literatures, where she taught courses in linguistics and language teaching. She retired in August, 2021, and is writing a book on the Christadora House that will be published by New Village Press in the fall of 2023. I'd wanna just let mention that we will, please, if you have questions as they come up, you can drop them in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat and we'll have a couple of times where we pause for questions. So we'll try to get to your question. We may not be able to get to everyone's, but we'll do our best. Um, so we hope you enjoy the program. And with no further ado, Joyce, please take it away. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Um, we were just talking a little bit beforehand and I mentioned that I was busy being retired. Uh, and this project is an example of that um, because I, did not do a lot of historical research at all um, most of my career and about five years ago I started on this one so I want to share how I came to it and also I have a great enthusiasm for the subject for the building for the people that I have met along the way I was just in New York and this time last week I was in the archives of Columbia University uh, they were very generous to let me in even though uh, they were booked until mid-May because of the pandemic. So um, I am fresh with uh, different pieces of information. So I'll, I'll get started. So the three central themes that will run through tonight are community relationships and social change. And those are very important. And they're not necessarily something that goes in order. Uh, they could very well just be in a circle, in a cycle. Um, but obviously you have to have relationships to make a community and then social change colors practically everything we do, but particularly when it comes to social movements like the uh, settlement house movement. And this is a, a, a quote that um, I found actually last week at the um, New York Historical Society. There is a very good exhibit if you are in New York on monuments. And um, this was on the wall and it says, history is not truth, it's memory. And a part of remembering is considering what we forgot. And I want you to just keep that in mind as we go along. I'm going to go, come back to memory and history uh, at the end of this talk, but history is not something that's monolithic and the people who remember things uh, are sort of inscribing history and passing on history but everybody's history that they remember is not the same. So this is the first part. I'm going to actually pause after the first part of the talk. I'm going to um, share how I became involved um, in this project, what settlement houses are and why they were instituted. Some of you might be very well versed, others might be um, have a little sketchier knowledge about that. And then Christina McCall is the central figure in Christadora House. 
And so Christina and some other women I'll be featuring of Christadora House. And then Christadora House itself, there are two main strands, the buildings, plural, because it wasn't, we'll, we'll um, go over how long actually the settlement house uh, proceeded in that building, which is surprisingly a short period, um, even though Christadora House endured for a very long time and does in its work now and then the work on the other side of that. And then for the second part, um, I'm gonna present some different ideas of what Christadora House is as imagined and also put into action by different people and different groups of people. I'll describe how Christadora lives on. And I think that we have some people um, from the board and from the Christadora organization in the audience. And then finally, the Lower East Side today, post COVID and into the future. Okay, so that's the, those are the two halves of my talk. So how my interest in this project developed, I found a collection of letters from 1918 from Helen Schechter to her English teacher, Ellen Gould. Now I didn't find the letters. The letters are in a folder in the archives of the New York Historical Society. I found the electronic listing of the letters um, and I was in immediately intrigued. And so I was able then to follow up and actually go and read the letters. I discovered the connection between the letters and Christadora House. So the letter writer was taking English lessons um, from Ellen Gould at Christadora House and my initial interest was that I have taught English as a second language teachers for many years. And that connection also intrigued me. And uh, I thought that this was something that I could look at from my perspective and also learn the historical facts surrounding the letters as well. And I've explored the archives at um, the New York Historical Society and Columbia University. Um, they have a, a rare book and manuscript library at Columbia and they have been very helpful. And the material itself from 1897, I think all the way up to 1990 um, has been archived there at Columbia and they're in um, many, many, many boxes. And so when I want to study the, this material, I need to order the boxes ahead of time and um, go through them. And I, I just recently went through four boxes last week and there's always something new to find. And then by doing all of this, I entered the world of the 19th and 20th century settlement houses, which I knew painfully little about. I knew about, I had lived in New York for many years. I knew about Henry Street. I'm from the Chicago area. I knew about Hull House, um, but I didn't understand all of the different nuances. I still don't understand all of them, but the different nuances of what they were and that they were so varied depending on the cities in which they were located. Okay, Settlement House, what, why? This is a quote from um, Daphne Spain, um, How Women Saved the City. I almost turned around because the book's on my shelf. Um, she calls places like the YWCA, the Salvation Army, she calls them redemptive places. Um, and not necessarily in a religious sense, um, but in the sense that people came to the city absolutely with nothing in many cases. And uh, there were, um, people who received the services. I'll describe like what those were in a minute. And there are women volunteers who were delivered from completely domestic lives. Many of them had, to, had graduated from colleges, especially the seven sisters um, colleges. And they didn't want to just go straight into marriage and do the kinds of things their families expected of them. They, um, many of them came and settled in these settlement houses. And so they um, also helped with this uh, deliverance of the city from strangers by helping the transition and helping them um, be supportive, giving support. 
So um, the places were generally located in the poorest areas of um, the cities where the settlers, okay, again, um, not the immigrants themselves, but um, young educated women and men, all right, but I'll be focusing on the women tonight. They came to live to forge these very special bonds with their neighbors and provide the kinds of social and educational services that the government on any level was just not providing at that point. So the goals of the settlement house, um, very often critics of the settlement house will say, this was just an Americanization mechanism. And um, to a large extent, and at many settlement houses, that's true, that assimilation just coming into the society and fitting in was definitely something that was, uh, I would say emphasized at some places, but just part of what some of the other settlement houses did. Acculturation, on the other hand, is trying to, to meld or combine the home cultures with the target culture, the new culture, rather than assimilating, it's more of a blending. And then there are other motives that different people ascribe and have ascribed to the um, settlement house movement. So there, I find the discussion and the, and the controversy very interesting because it, when you look at some, uh, an institution like the settlement house, it's good to try to go at it from a balanced um, point of view. And um, there were certainly critics and there were certainly people who advocated for the settlement houses and there were interesting conversations at different points of history. And many settlement house leaders, different people who came out of the settlement house took up causes of uh, the different kinds of things that were happening uh, at the time, some, some of which happen um, still, but especially there was child labor um, defending workers against these really awful working conditions. One of the um, settlement house women was Florence Kelly. I'm not really gonna talk about her tonight, but she was the first factory uh, female factory inspector in the United States. And she really did a lot to um, draft and, and help support um, child um, laws that prevented um, child labor from being as, as endemic as it was at the time. So why did they come? People came to the settlement because they needed it. They needed what was offered there. The, um, when you read about settlement houses, when you talk about people who were involved, uh, health clinics, um, health, Henry Street was the, the beginning of the Visiting Nurse Association. Um, health clinics were important and also playgrounds and green spaces. Uh, these were, really hallmarks of settlement houses, and they were very much needed, um, especially uh, at the end of the 1800s and uh, the beginning of the 1900s. So here's an example of one of these playgrounds. This is um, the Madison House Yard. Um, and this is a quote from uh, Christina McCall, who was the head worker of Christadora House, starting from 1897 from the beginning. And I'll be talking about her quite a bit. And I like this, quote, because it's very succinct that a settlement is a place for gathering and distributing all the forces of society. I would add there also the resources of society because um, a lot of times the people who came, the migrants from the deep, deep South, especially uh, you had um, blacks coming up from the deep South, you had people coming from across the oceans, um, and they really needed the resources that these settlement houses had to offer. So here's a, a fa fairly intimidating woman, um, Emma Goldman. She was not a fan. She was um, an anarchist, a very powerful, well, powerful in her own head more than in, in person, but she um, uh, really did not like the settlement house and, and she was very vocal about it. And so she said in her, her memoir, 
Um, they teach them to eat with a fork and a knife, big deal. But if they don't have anything to eat, what good is that? And that was a very common criticism of the settlement house that they were more about etiquette than they were about substance. But I think that that criticism uh, is, is unfounded in, especially in most of the settlement houses, um, but etiquette and, and fitting in were definitely two strands that fit in to settlement work very often. And so this is a quote from Margaret Widmer. Now, if you're like me, I had no idea who Margaret Widmer was. Uh, she was a very famous poet. Um, and this snippet uh, from this poem, I am convinced, even though I haven't found evidence of it, that this describes uh, a night when women were just relaxing and dancing at Christadora House because it's women who came someplace after they had worked and they danced. And so I love this image of these, um, these old women dancing um, and forgetting their cares, at least for a while. So Christina, so that, um, that was one woman and we'll come back to her. Christina McCall and Sarah Carson were the two founders and they met while working at the Harlem w YWCA. They were not wealthy. Um, they did not have a lot of money, but they realized in their work that the Lower East Side was someplace that really was in need of a settlement house. And Christina was drawn to this concept after visiting Toynbee Hall in England. And Deborah later will talk a little bit about um, the settlement house um, concept sort of starting off in, in England, very different from what settlement houses ended up being. Um, but a lot of these different um, leaders, Jane Adams, different people went to Toynbee to see what was happening and how the people in these different neighborhoods were being helped by settlement houses. And so this is a quote from June Hopkins, who was a granddaughter of Harry Hopkins. Harry Hopkins got his first job at Christadora House, uh, being a counselor to boys. And uh, this is an account of that first, that first impetus um, of Christadora House. And they rented the cellar of a deli. Um, they said that, imagine, I was thinking of how we had these makeshift boundaries and, and things um, during COVID. It's continuing, it's not over. Um, and so they had this flimsy uh, barrier, but the um, sauerkraut was on the other side. And so what somebody described uh, the, uh, the first uh, women's, young women's settlement as having a German flavor <laughs> from the sauerkraut. Um, the, these young women also, um, lived upstairs on the second and third floors uh, of this building and they called their enterprise the Young Women's Settlement. So when it opened in 1897, uh, Christa Door House was the only settlement in that, in that district uh, and it was packed. It was very densely populated. Uh, over uh, half of the inhabitants were foreign born and um, immigrants were concentrated in this, this neighborhood and other neighborhoods um, to a degree that it was very obvious that there needed to be some support system and settlement houses in this particular part of, of the Lower East Side of the East Village was one place, but there were many, many neighborhoods um, all over the different um, boroughs of Manhattan that had settlement houses. So Christina McCall provided leadership as head worker. And that's a very interesting, we were also talking uh, a few minutes ago about titles um, and you know, whether someone wants to be called doctor or Mr. or Mrs. Um, she was called both Miss McCall and head worker. Um, and she was in that role from 1897 until her death in 1939. Actually, that might be misstating. I think she might have actually retired a few years before that, um, but not many. Okay, so her 
most of her, her life. She was born in 1864. She wanted to go to Smith College, but she um, ended up going to the Emerson College of Oratory in Boston. But Smith College had very close ties with um, Krista Dora House and some of the archives up at Smith College. Um, I'm hoping to get up there and see what they have kept from some of these young women who actually came to Krista Dora House as part of their, their education. Um, and Christina exemplified the kinds of contributions that women made to the work and also the philosophy, the ethos of the settlement house. This is Helen Schechter in her later years. She was the one who, um, who wrote the uh, letters and uh, she talks about how her daughter showed up. She was at the camp, North Ogre camp, that was sponsored by Krista Dora. And if you read this quote, uh, she's not as thrilled about the frog as her daughter is. And um, she writes the way she talked. And that's one of, from someone who trained English as a second language teachers, um, it was very interesting to me. Those letters, 33 letters were written between January and December of 2000, or 1918. Um, and I could see the development of her English very clearly. And so um, this was, this appears if someone's interested in seeing this whole article that this comes from, um, these are the actual, this is from an actual letter. Okay, I've, I've seen this letter, um, but one of the librarians, Tammy Kiter, she wrote in New York Historical Society's blog um, about different camps that um, children, from New York City went to, and Krista Dora's camp, Northover, was just one in New Jersey. Um, so the the, the blog um, is uh, the entry is Happy Campers, I think, but I have it in my reference list at the end of this talk, and I believe that that will be uh, posted somewhere if people wanted to to look at that later. So she had a lot of different roles on the Helen Schechter. And so this is, this is just a snapshot of the two of them. Helen Schechter was the immigrant who was receiving this letter, these lessons. Ellen Gould was her teacher. We know a lot more about Helen Schechter because um, she wrote the letters and she talked about her background and her life. And she was disappointed that her parents chose to educate her brothers and not her. Um, it was very common at the time. And so she came to the uh, US at the age of 18 with the intention to help support her family back in Europe. Um, she was a widow with four children in, in the year 1918. And her teacher was Ellen Gould. I've done some digging. I found some things out about her. Um, no letters from her. So we only have the letters from one side. Um, she was a donor for years after she taught at Christadora. And I've seen the, some of those letters where she said, here's $10. I really miss all the people. And my time there was very happy. And so she was from Minnesota and was a University of Minnesota graduate. So she was a, a college woman, but not from the East Coast, from the Midwest. This is a photo of Margaret Whittemer, who, uh, from whom that quote came. Um, she was a novelist, and she won the Pulitzer Prize in 1919 for her poetry collection, Old Road to Paradise. Now, I didn't know they did this, but she shared the Pulitzer with Carl Sandburg. Now, Carl Sandburg is probably more, much more on our radar in terms of famous poets than Margaret Whittemer, but I'm changing that tonight and letting you know that she was just as good and just as important as um, people like Carl Sandburg, Robert Frost, all of whom were members of the Poets Guild, which was definitely an accomplishment that shows up in different history books, um, shows up when Krista Dorhouse is mentioned. And so the Poets Guild, what you could do was you could go and you could um, choose poems from uh, all of these different poets, some of whom were very famous, you pay five cents a poem, and they would put it together in what they would call the Unbound Anthology. And so everyone could choose the poems that spoke to them, 
and have their little uh, sort of chat book and you know invest 25 cents or maybe even more and you had um, these poems and so this was just a way of, of raising money at Christador House but also it was um, something that put them on the map because many of the settlement houses were very important centers for the arts, for theater, for literature, for music. And one of, of the mentions of Christadora House that pops up fairly often is that it was the site of George Gershwin's first recital. It wasn't very well received at the time, but um, he uh, sort of broke into the music um, scene at Christadora House. So this is a recollection that I, um, I read from 1933. So this is quite a few years after 1897, uh, which is what is being described here. And they had almost a hundred girls and they had a big sign saying, well, all girls over 16 who live in this neighborhood welcome us this evening at eight. You are all invited, free. So imagine that you work in a cigar factory or you work in a sweatshop and someone says, come tonight, relax, and you don't have to pay a penny. And so they had to, 98 people show up. So the building, buildings, um, as I said, the cellar in uh, 1897, they moved to a nearby building a year later because they just had too many people showing up and it was renamed at the then Christadora House. Part of that was that boys weren't as likely to show up. They did, um, there, there was a building that they actually bought at one point to provide services for boys, but they wanted to expand their clientele. So there were, um, when, from the young women's settlement, there were families, there were boys, there were um, different people who were involved in the work of Christadora. So it was better to have another name. Now, the problem um, with Christadora, uh, I mean, not really problem, but the issue with the name Christadora is that it has Christ in it. And so imagine you have all of these Jewish immigrants who um, understandably would not send their kids through that door, um, but many of them like, like Helen Schechter, uh, she didn't care um, because she needed those services. She liked the people, she trusted the people. And um, she, there was a certain amount, I'm not gonna go into the whole religious aspect if somebody wants, has a question about that, but Christina McCall was unabashedly a Christian. A Christian. Um, she had Bible readings on Sunday, but as far as proselytizing, it was done in a in probably a, a more um, subtle way, but I did read um, a recollection by someone who had gone there as a child, and he said that um, what they learned at Christadora and other places tended to wean them from their traditions. And so even if somebody is not hitting you over the head trying to convert you, uh, the Bible study and, and the different mentions and the songs and everything was definitely something that emphasized Christianity. And the settlement houses are known for, uh, a, it, it's a kind of doctrine, it's a doctrine called the social gospel. And it's very interesting because it's a social movement that took from religion, specifically Christianity, but in a way that was not tied to any particular denomination in most cases, okay? And so the buildings on the one hand, the work on the other, they taught classes in English, uh, hat making, millinery, typing, other subjects, home of the Poets Guild. They had a medical clinic, was a center for music and theater and functioned as a training ground for social workers. And this is true for many of the settlement houses because social work was just starting to become a, a profession and a career and something you could study. It was called the skyscraper settlement. And um, it was constructed in 1928 
at um, 143 Avenue B with a donation from Arthur Curtis James and his wife, Harriet. Arthur Curtis James was a railroad tycoon. He also was heavily invested in copper mines. And um, there is actually a, a documentary that I ran across not too long ago. Um, I'm not sure I have it written down, but it, um, it was, I don't have it written down, but it, there's a documentary about Arthur Curtis James. So put your Google skills to work. Harriet James was often referred to as the godmother of Christodora. I just read that in something, someone's um, diary uh, that I read last week um, that she thought of Harriet James as the godmother of Christodora. Um, and Harriet James left, I think, $100,000 when she died to both the YWCA and to Christodora. Um, it operated as a settlement house only until the 40s in this building. Okay, so think about from 1897, it was a settlement house. And then 1928, we have this building. And then in the 40s, um, they went elsewhere. Okay, talk about that in a minute. And it was added to the National Register, Register of historic places in 1986. And why was that? It's a beautiful building, okay? And so some of the detail, we have some of the friezes and the doorway, and um, it was hard to just to decide on which, which photos to, to actually take. But even just looking at this um, little collection, you can see that the building is beautiful. Laura has the, the privilege of walking in there every day, um, as do other people um, and people who live there as well. Um, and so there's a reason that it is, it has that honor. So the fate, fates of, of Christodora, it was sold via condemnation to the city of New York in 1948. Uh, one account that I read said it was pretty much stolen by the city of New York and that it wasn't really condemnable. condemnable. If that's a word. Um, it was abandoned and used for various nefarious and other purposes until 1975. It changed hands over the years until it was bought in 1986 to convert to condominiums. And it was one of the sparks that ignited the Tompkins Square riot of 1988. Okay, so it has lots of different um, pieces of the history that, that together um, make it a very, a very historic building for lots and lots of different reasons. And speaking of history, this painting um, was commissioned by the, um, the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, um, and it's by M.A. Tricka, um, and it was painted in 1934. It belongs to the Smithsonian um, American Art Museum. It is not on, on display right now, um, but museums only display about 1% of their collections, I've been told. Um, and it really looks like something that um, is a WPA, could be a mural. This one happens to be a um, oil painting. So at this point, I've given you lots and lots of information. You're gonna get more, um, but if there are a couple of questions that we can um, answer, I'd be happy to help do that. Yeah, um, we, we, have some, we have some good questions. One, one person mentioned that June Hopkins married Harry Hopkins and was not, not the granddaughter, but um, we also have a, um, a citation for, about the granddaughter who's an historian. So I wanna drop that into the chat. And I just wanted to, I don't know if you have anything you wanna say about that. Well, he that. was married to Ethel Gross. He had two, he had two um, wives. He was married to Ethel Gross first and he met her um, uh, at the settlement house. Um, my understanding is that she was the granddaughter and I, I've, I've read several articles and books by her. So right. um, he might've been married to someone also called June, but his granddaughter was June Hawkins. So I just dropped the link uh, to that article about that in the chat for people who would like to read a little more about that. Um, and we also had a question, did women live at the Christodora house or did they just come for day services? Oh, thank you. That's, like, that's why a... did they need a skyscraper? What were all those rooms for? Um, the first five floors were the settlement house business. 
okay, there was the clinics and the different things. There was a, there was a pool, there was a gymnasium. Um, and then the other, um, I'm glad that question was asked because the other nine plus floors um, were for, they were residences for, um, it was, I wouldn't say they were necessarily white collar uh, workers, but they were people who could afford um, the, the rent. It's not, it's not, they weren't as pricey accommodations as exist now, um, but they uh, were able to pay a modest amount more than the neighbors could afford. Okay, so these were maybe um, secretaries or law students and different people. And they were encouraged to volunteer um, at Christador House, but the, um, the, the settlers, my understanding is that they that they were on the first five floors, their accommodations, but they might have also been um, upstairs as well. So the first five floors were really for the business of the, the settlement house. Great, thank you. Um, and then um, we have someone saying the Gershwin concert we think was at a, was that at a previous building, not the one that's still standing or was it here? Do you know? I sure. would I would have to look that up. Okay, we'll, we'll follow up on that then, but that's a great question. Um, and I'm looking for the documentary. So I, people are very curious about the Arthur Curtis James documentary. So mm -hmm. I'm looking for that right now. Okay. Restoring, I, I just restoring found Arthur, it. does that sound right? No, of rails and sails. Of rails and sails. Okay, I got it. Yeah. And I'll drop that in the chat. And there was an article, I found an article in the New York Times. Um, it, it seems to me that the, the, um, the year 2016 or 14 um, is in my head. Um, it wasn't a long time ago, but it wasn't recent recent. So right. but it, is, it is of rails and sails. That's the name okay, of it. Okay, I got it. I'm gonna throw it in right now. Okay. And I see that's all I'm seeing if you want to okay. plow ahead. Oh, I, I do have some few new messages. Let me read those while I'm... Um, okay. And we might have some time, but Deborah also has um, some yeah. minutes that I don't want to take away from her. No, no, no. We just a few. So how common was it for Christian men to meet and marry Jewish women? <laughs> 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 well... Um, being someone who has married at least two people from different ethnicities and religions, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I really, I really can't say, but I think I can say that the settlement house really put together people from very different social classes and backgrounds. And so it's not surprising to me that um, Ethel Gross and Harry Hopkins met um, at uh, Christador House. Um, and some of the, the social boundaries and barriers that existed at the time, they all had a common purpose. And so, um, you know, being boyfriend, girlfriend, being friends, being husband and wife, it was not unusual for them to, to get to know each other on a different level than they would have if the settlement house didn't exist. So, um... Little little follow up on the Gershwin question. It was okay. it was a, it was a debut in 1914 okay. at the Finley Club. Okay. Um, the settlement and so the question is um, the question is where was that and you know where would they have hosted this concert? Which I'm, I think we'll have to look look that up. Um, the, the the other question that that I think we can answer right now is why did the city repossess it? Why was it abandoned and why was it city, why, why, why did it fail to the point where the city took it back? Yeah, it's- I, After I think, only 20 years, which really is startling. Like when we think about how this building is envisioned, uh, the whole movement is envisioned in this building. So it's really interesting that it, it only is 20 years. And, and from um, recent things that I've read, um, you know, read last week actually, I, was, I had some folders I hadn't looked at before that were from the 40s and they were bleeding money. Um, they just they were just spending so much more money than they were taking in. And so um, I read another fairly incendiary um, article that said that it was stolen by the city, that was not condemnable, but that it, it was 
probably in a vulnerable position financially. Um, and so I would say that there was prob there's probably truth in both of those. That, that's great. So there's some suggestions that the Gersh were fascination about the Gershwins that they may have performed to did they perform to raise funds and um, well, know, I do know the settlement I, house. I know a little bit about that. Um, uh, George Gershwin's brother was a member of the Finley Club, and so I think they had to provide entertainment. Um, and so uh, the the club, I, I, and there were so many clubs, 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 all kinds of clubs. And uh, they, they put on performances and things like that. And so I think that he was doing it as a favor to his brother uh, who probably had to provide the entertainment um, for, for the evening. And so I don't know if it was something that people paid for or if they just right. um, came as a performance. And then there's just clarification that the settlement house here did not fail. The city took it by eminent domain which the board fought and, and ultimately won a settlement. Okay. So right. that's that's the way it goes. So let's move on. Thank you everyone for your Thank comments you. and knowledge. I'm learning so much tonight, it's crazy. And through my, my, my new friendship with Joyce, it's really, well, it's and, really and, fascinating how much, um, how much went on here. And so. also I, I found Laura because I one day said, oh my God, there's a nonprofit in Christadora. I have to know more about this. So I just called her, it was a cold call and <laughs> interviewed her. And, and that was what, two years ago, right? right. Something like that. Do Lot we know that. why the city wanted to take the building, Joyce? Like, why were they so interested in it? Or it just was a nice building and they were like, did, well, so what I, did they want? I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be researching that more, but I have a feeling that it was like, they were in a vulnerable place and, this, and the city, did what the city does and said, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, it's not the first time we've heard that story. It's not, it's not the first and won't be the last, I don't think. So, uh, so Christodora's work and provisions obviously was in different buildings. So um, George Gershwin was giving his, his performance, not in the uh, building built in 1928, but in one of the interim buildings. Um, and so the, the work itself is not something that stopped uh, once they got out of that building. It was housed for a time at the Jacob Reese houses, um, but still referred to as Christadora House. So they had a presence even when they were um, moved out of their own quarters. And then in 1959, I just got this from someone who works at, at Christadora um, now um, that uh, these buildings on East First Street were purchased and that it was the official address of Christadora and then various addresses until the present site. Okay, so, so think about the work kept on, even though the buildings changed, so the physical uh, location was not um, as important as the work continuing. So the settlement house filled a genuine need um, at a certain point in history. And then after some of, uh, after this, some of the houses and the, the organization, so you know, the World War One is a, is a um, a marker for the settlement house movement kind of petering out, um, but then, uh, and others eventually cease to exist, but some still exist now. And they're just very, very uh, versatile in terms of, okay, this is what we do now because the times demand it. And this is a very nice quote from the university uh, settlement that um, our history informs us, but does not bond, bind us that we honor it. As our neighborhoods change, we change. So this is, um, I really like this because it says, even though maybe some of the physical places with the, the original mission are no longer with us, the work is still important. So here are some ideas of Christodora. I'll just pop these up for you. Um, depending on what people needed, Christodora settlement house and also Christodora after the settlement house. Um, sign of urban decay, a symbol of protest, gentrification, a site value, valued for its historical significance. Um, and now it has um, morphed into a nonprofit that promotes, that promotes um, environmental education and leadership. And so this little um, red circle here is a, a medallion, a historical medallion that is on the building, I, I understand. Um, that honors um, Harry um, Hopkins and his work.
And this is uh, from Krista Dora's um, website and their mottos are nature, learning and leadership. And they work with, um, with uh, middle and high school students and they have continued that tradition of, of going out in nature and um, exposing kids to the natural world who might be more city kids who go to Central Park and might go to the zoo, but don't have those wide open spaces. Um, so just about done. Um, the culture of the Lower East Side, I came up with resistance, resilience, and sustainability as three of the hallmarks. And um, sustainability is really sort of holding on the ability to maintain something at the current level or avoid depletion in case of the environment when we talk about sustainability. And then perennial issues that have gone on um, for a very long time, a very partial list, poverty, housing, and respecting diversity. And housing has been um, a red button issue for a long time in the East Village. And then uh, COVID has complicated um, things even more. Um, the attacks against Asian Americans has happened in the Lower East Side and other neighborhoods and all over the country. And so um, the, you know, having advocates to, um, to fight for uh, residents, fight for cultures surviving, all of that is very important. So relationships are the basis of community, going back to that original, um, those original um, themes. Women were instrumental in the settlement house movement. The day-to-day -day work of the settlement house um, has often been overlooked. So we hear about people like Jane Addams and Lillian Wald, but they were very public figures. And people like Christina McFall were not as well known. And that might be the first time that many, if not most of you have heard of her. Memory, um, if we uh, remember something, we can make it visible and we can give a voice to people who might not otherwise be known about. Um, and social change is fluid and inevitable and always has been. Um, and we know very well that that's the case from recent history and from our lives in general. So I'll leave you with this excerpt from The Garden by Margaret Whitmer. And um, I like this, I was just in the city. Uh, so if you go um, kind of to the middle, Though the long years lie between and I am far away, when the world is hard now, when the city's clanging tires, when the city's clanging tires my ears and tires my heart and dust lies everywhere, I can dream the peace still of the soft winds shining. I can be a child still and hide my heart from care. So that is um, a poem by, part of a poem by Margaret Whitmer, And uh, that's all I have. Thank you so much, Joyce. That has, it's been amazing. And I, I, I want to really, I want to thank you for, for you, for not just being here and sharing this, this story and these really, your, your new discoveries, but for your willing to come, you know, put it out there, you know, a half, when, when you, the pie is just in the, you've got the ingredients all over the kitchen table and you're just starting to put the pie together. Um, we really appreciate it. We have people on the call who filmed the Tompkins Square Park riots. We have people who, um, who, you know, obviously are very vested in this neighborhood, very vested in the Lower East Side, have been here for a long time and know a lot. Um, but as you said in the beginning, we all have our memories and we all have our parts of the picture mm -hmm. that really began in the in the late 1800s which is it just it's really just fascinating how long this organization goes back and i'm sure that as you proceed in your research and in putting the book together uh, you're just in the beginning that you will you know bring a lot more have a lot more conversations and bring a lot more in into the discussion than we're able to do this evening. But before um, any more questions, we'd like to let our audience know about Lesby's work on three other settlement house buildings on the Lower East Side. These are located further south below Houston Street. And Lesby submitted requests for evaluation of these buildings to the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. The commission responded that they merit further study, but that depends on where they fit into the commission's priorities 
for all five boroughs. And we, we have long um, highlighted the few, the, the small amount of landmarking and pre preservation work here when you compare it to Manhattan as a whole. It's um, it, like many other things, the, the attention is mostly further west, further north and not, not in our area. So um, we haven't heard anything back in, in, in almost a year. And my fellow Lespie board member, Deborah Y will, would like to share some knowledge, her knowledge of these buildings and the research she's been doing very briefly. And then we'll come back for more questions. Thanks. Um, should um, Joyce stop her screen or can I go ahead and sh uh, share my Yes, Joyce. Can if you, there we okay. go. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so you see here the um, buildings for three settlement houses founded at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, the university settlement on the left was the first such organization established in the United States. We propose these three buildings for landmarking because of their architectural excellence, as well as their cultural significance. But today, following Joyce's lead, I want to point to some of their connections to women's history in the early years. First, though, uh, I'd like to give you a closer look at each building. The university settlement was built in the neo-federal style, and it's quite elegant and stately. This style was probably chosen as a symbolic reference to early American ideals and patriotism aimed at the immigrant community. The Educational Alliance building projects strength, dignity, and a sense of purpose. It was designed in a combination of the neo-Renaissance style seen in the handsome cornice and the Romanesque revival style with repeating arches stretching across the ground floor and the top floor. Its facade also has detailed ornamentation as seen here. The former Grand Street settlement is to me the most unusual. Its style is Flemish revival and its exuberant combination of brick and white stone detailing gives it a singular presence in the neighborhood. This uniqueness was noted ever since the time it first opened in 1905. Now I'd like to turn to some notable women connected to each of these settlement houses in the early years. The university settlement followed a precedent established in London that would send mostly college educated men into poor neighborhoods with hopes of contributing to positive social change. Such organizations were founded by prominent male philanthropists. In fact, Theodore Roosevelt, a patrician reformer himself, spoke at the dedication of this university settlement building. But women had a role too. I wanna to point to Eleanor Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt's niece and wife of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who taught a social dance class at the university settlement. In fact, FDR later credited Eleanor with opening his eyes to the plight of immigrant neighborhoods. And he called the university settlement a landmark in the social history of America. One might wonder how Rose Pastor Stokes, a Jewish immigrant, former cigar factory worker, journalist, and radical social activist fits into the story of the university settlement. In fact, she was sent there as a reporter for a Yiddish newspaper to interview one of its leaders, Graham Phelps Stokes, a member of one of the city's most distinguished families. They ended up marrying in a truly Cinderella tale. Rose then volunteered as a teacher and counselor at the settlement house. And she also ran a summer camp for teenage girls who were from both the university settlement and the educational alliance where she was also active. For those who might um, like more information about Rose Pastor Stokes, Lesby did a webinar on her life, um, which is available on our YouTube channel, if you'd like to look there. Like the university settlement, the Educational Alliance was founded by wealthy benefactors. But unlike the Protestant elite of the university settlement, Educational Alliance was founded by Jewish philanthropists. 
who hope to assimilate the newly arrived Eastern European Jews who are crowding into this neighborhood. It's not surprising that Rose Pastor Stokes would offer classes here and would meet another young Jewish immigrant, Anzia Yazerska, who taught cooking under the rubric domestic arts. Yazerska would, would become a well-known author, writing vividly of immigrant life on the Lower East Side. One of her novels, which also became a movie, was called Salome of the Tenements. It was based on the unusual marriage of her friend Rose Pastor and Graham Phelps Stokes. But more surprisingly, on a leadership board dominated by men, there was also Julia Richmond, a longtime educator, who herself was from a well-to-do family. She even became director of Educational Alliance for a time before being named District Superintendent of Schools for the Lower East Side. Along with her job for the city's Department of Education, Julia Richmond also remained involved with the Educational Alliance for the rest of her life. Some may know the former Julia Richmond High School on the Upper East Side, which is now called the Julia Richmond Educational Complex. Finally, we have the building that once housed the Grand Street Settlement. In this case, the organization was established by a woman, Rose Gruening, who was also from a prosperous New York family. It is said that she used her own money to finance the organization and did not take compensation for her work there. She would even fund college educations for some of the young participants of the settlement house. For all her contributions to the neighborhood, Rose Gruening was called the Angel of Grand Street. She certainly follows in the great tradition of women's settlement house leaders like Lillian Wald of Henry Street, Jane Adams of Hull House in Chicago, and the women Joyce talked about tonight from Christa Dora House. Although men were certainly involved, settlement houses gave a significant new option to young women for work outside the home. I read a book recently that jo Joyce also referenced about this time period called How Women Save the City, and settlement house work had a major role. I'm very happy to say that all three settlement uh, house organizations, the University Settlement and the Educational Alliance and the Grand Street Settlement are all very active today. The University Settlement and the Educational Alliance are in the, the headquarters in the same buildings I showed you. The Grand Street Settlement is elsewhere and they have many satellite locations. So we just thought we'd bring you up to date on some of Lesby's work in preservation. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Richard just for a few minutes here. Um, but I'm also going to add into the chat, um, we, Lesby had written a blog on settlement houses. And I'm just putting that into the chat for anybody who might be interested. And it let turn it over to Richard to let him wrap things up for us. Thanks. Okay, thanks, uh, Laura, and uh, thanks, uh, Deborah and Joyce. And uh, really, uh, I learned so much tonight, Joyce. Uh, really, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was a very special, uh, very special evening for us. Um, for those of you who don't know us, uh, Lesby is a not-for-profit organization, uh, volunteer organization dedicated to the preservation of uh, historic streetscapes and uh, historic buildings in the traditional Lower East Side, which up until probably uh, the, the early 1960s in, was considered to include uh, the East Village, Lower East Side below um, Houston Street, Chinatown, Little Italy, and the Bowery. And um, as Joyce noted, uh, since the 1980s, Chris Adora House has been listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And, and this would uh, theoretically have uh, given the developers uh, for, for the building's conversion to apartments, tax credits for the work. So for better or worse, um, the, the conversion of the building was uh, probably due in part to these tax credits that are available to national re register properties um, if a certain amount of restoration work is done. Uh, however, um, national register listing does not really confer any uh, real protection on historic building facades. And only uh, New York City landmarking can really provide that kind of protection. And um, 
So uh, LESPI, along with the East Village Community Coalition and our allied uh, organization, have pr proposed an expansion of the existing East 10th Street Historic District, which is a, a New York City uh, historic district on the north side of Tompkins Square Park, kind of around the corner from Christodora House. And uh, we've, we've proposed expanding the district uh, to wrap around uh, the east side of Tompkins Square Park to make kind of an L shape, uh, fi final district shape. Uh, and uh, that would go from East 10th Street to East 7th Street and would also include the, the Christodora building. So um, this proposal uh, has been presented to council member uh, Carlina Rivera and uh, we're kind of waiting, you know, for her to hopefully at some point move forward to with it, or to see if the political uh, environment is 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 a little better for uh, preservation in this area. So, uh, on a different note, uh, for those of you who missed some or all of tonight's presentation, a video of it uh, will be posted on Lesby's YouTube channel, uh, which you can get to from our. Uh, website here lesby-nyc.org and maybe I'll, I'll i'll stick it in i'll stick it in the chat here for everybody uh as well the uh the url and um it should the presentation uh should be up within about a week our youtube channel also includes other webinars we presented on a variety of uh lower east side um topics as uh deborah had uh, hinted at uh, before uh, keep an eye open for future Lesby webinars, uh, including lectures and book talks, and uh, to keep up to date with what's going on with Lesby and preservation in the Lower East Side, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and or uh, join our email list, uh, which again you can do on our website uh, shown here. And uh, finally, uh, please consider making a donation today to Lesby. Uh, we need donations to help us continue to produce webinars such as this one, and continue our advocacy work for Lower East Side preservation, which now with a new city administration in place is a crucial aspect of our work. You can find a donate button on your original invitation to this event and as you probably guessed at our website uh, shown here. Um, I wanna thank uh, again, uh, Joyce and, and, and Deborah for their wonderful uh, presentations. And of course, um, also Laura for moderating and uh, as a reminder, Joyce's new book is coming out uh, on New Village Press in the fall of uh, 2023. And uh, I want to thank all of you, our audience, uh, for attending. We're always uh, very happy uh, when, uh, when people join us for these, these webinars. So thank you again. And everybody, uh, have a good night. Thank you. Richard? Yes. Could I put up the, my um, my um, list of of um, references? There we oh, go. Yeah. Oh sure. Okay. Everybody um, who's still here can take a screenshot. <laughs> yeah, and and actually, didn't you say that you're going to put it up on your site, Laura? Yes, I'd be happy. We'll we'll, we'll get we'll we'll list it. Okay. Or they send it around. And, and it's one of those things that I just wanted to, to highlight um, that uh, June Hopkins, a couple of things by her. That's um, great. And I think you sold a few books tonight. Um, <laughs> to uh, well, now I have the, so, now I have the, uh, the, <laughs> the, the pressure, right? Thank, so, thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll see if we can, um, we'll, we'll, I'll talk with Richard. We'll see how we can get this uh, circulated. Okay. All thank right. You, All right. Thanks thank again. you. Okay, so good night, everyone. everyone.